Very good evening, everyone. Today we are going to talk about interpretation of the bladder diary. Sorry. So we will talk about the interpretation of the bladder diary. Bladder diary is very important for your section one as well as section two. And when we talk about this uh, section one in your section one, you're going to get MCQs with different options and they'll give you scenarios or they will just give you the charts and you have to find out what is the diagnosis. We'll discuss it in detail. And in your section two, you will be handed over a bladder diary while we are discussing uh, these functional scenarios. You will get a bladder diary and you'll be asked to interpret what it is. What are important findings are there? There's a systematic way to go through it. We will talk about it so that you don't take more than 30 seconds to one minute while answering a question related to your bladder diary. Even in your MCQ, you cannot spend much time because it's uh, uh, it's a time-limited exam, okay? So this is a very classical article by Paul Abrahams where they have been a basic format of your bladder diary uh, explaining, explaining the way how to get a bladder diary done. Make sure you look at the time the patient goes to bed and the patient works up. This is important because you have to calculate the number of daytime frequencies, nighttime frequencies based on this information. So have a quick view of the bladder diary. There will be options like this in your section one, overactive bladder stress in contrast, nocturnal polyuria, diabetes, insipid polyuria. So both all these terms are important because there will be uh, there will be scenarios, there will be charts given, and you have to find out what is the exact diagnosis for that patient. I'll take up a scenario and explain to you. So this is the frequency volume chart of one patient and this is patient two and patient one. Now, if you find the if you ask me what is the first thing to look for in the bladder diary given to you, the first thing is look for whether the patient is having incontinence or not. So first thing is look for whether the patient is leaking or not. If the patient is leaking, the diagnosis you have to think is either an urge or stress incontinence that the patient is having. So your diagnosis will be an urge incontinence versus a stress urinary incontinence. Now, how do you differentiate the two? The urge incontinence are usually associated with frequency and nocturia. However, the stress will not be associated with any of these symptoms. However, there will be uh, associated history if given. It's good and easy for you to differentiate. If not, based on the chart, always look for frequency and nocturia. So if you look at these two charts, there, there is a lot of frequencies here. There is a nocturia episode as well. So this is more likely a patient with a urge incontinence or an overactive bladder wet type. Okay, so this kind of charts you get. This is one of the easiest charts that you can expect in your exam. Okay, so the first thing, as I said, to look in your bladder diary is the voiding phase and in the voiding chart, in the voiding column, what you look for is the presence of leak or not. If the patient is leaking, then you think and differentiate the two causes of the leak. Otherwise, the next thing that you look for is the daytime frequency. The daytime frequency starts from the morning and it continues till the patient falls, till the, till the patient goes to bed with the intention to sleep. So it will all come under the daytime frequency. Okay, so you might be asked how many daytime frequencies. Calculate all the daytime frequencies, all the void, uh, all the time the patient goes to bed until the patient goes to bed uh, with the wakes up till the patient goes to bed with the intention to sleep. All will come under the daytime frequency. Now, what is uh, let, let us check up one more uh, thing. What is nighttime frequency then? So if you look at this, patient goes to bed and he uh, before he falls asleep, he goes to uh, he goes to void. He falls asleep, he goes to void again, wakes up, and then he again sleeps and again goes up. Uh, so he has to after he goes to bed with the intention to sleep, he wakes up three times, and uh, this all the time that he wakes up comes under the, all these episodes of voiding comes under nocturnal frequency, which is three, okay? And when he wakes up the next day with the intention of getting up, the frequency stops. You stop counting the nocturnal frequencies. So when the patient goes with the intention to sleep until the intention to rising, all the frequencies will come under a nocturnal frequency. However, what do you mean by nocturia? So if the patient goes to bed, and he goes to void before he sleeps again. So this is not nocturia. There has to be an episode of sleep and there has to be, it has to be for, uh, followed by sleep. Okay, so this is the recent modification in 2018. So this is the recent modification in 2018 by the uh, ICS. And this is what is being followed in your MCQs and you might end up marking the wrong option if you don't uh, know the update. So remember this example, the patient goes to bed he is not yet into sleep. He's waiting, he's waiting, but he wakes up again, he goes to the washroom, and then he uh, falls asleep. 
This frequency is not included under nocturia. This will only be counted under nighttime frequency. Okay. However, if a patient falls asleep, he wakes up, goes to sleep, wakes up, all this will come under nocturia. Okay. So this is the basic definition of nocturia and nocturnal frequency, which you should not confuse while you're marking an MCQ. What is nocturnal urinary volume? So if you look at this chart, okay, so it starts from 7 a.m. The patient voids 200 ml. And the, so this goes on the daytime frequency and this is uh, the patient uh, goes to bed at 11, okay? Then uh, he wakes up uh, to void at 11, one. So there uh, he wakes up four times at night. And again, uh, when he wakes up at morning, the first urine that he passes is 200 ml. So the nocturnal urinary volume, it includes all the urinary volume that the patient passes after going to bed. Okay. So after bed and even including the first volume of the next day. So that will be included under nocturnal urinary volume. So here, Remember, this is how you calculate your nocturnal urinary volume. If you don't calculate it correctly, you will be marking wrongly. And same patient, if you have to calculate the total 24-hour urine volume, so make sure you include all this, all this, okay? And include the 200 ml of the next day, but you don't include the first voided volume of the, uh, of the day the diary started because that's the previous day volume, okay? So please make sure you go through this examples, try to understand what is a 24 hour volume, what is a nocturnal volume, because if you know the ratio of the nocturnal urinary volume by total voided volume, if the ratio comes out to be more than 20 to 33%, then this is known as a nocturnal polyuria. 20% in adults, 33% in elderly, okay? So in young adults, it is 20%, 33% in elderly. If this is the volume, you call them as a nocturnal polyuria. And there are different causes of nocturnal polyuria. Slowly, again, just quickly to understand. When you are given a diary, always think, always look at the time the patient goes to bed, the patient sleeps, and the patient wakes up. This will decide your nighttime frequency, your nocturia. Both are not same. When, you, when the patient is voiding, the nocturnal urinary volume, always remember it's a nighttime frequencies. You add up all the nighttime frequencies, not just the nocturia, add up all the nighttime frequencies, including the volume of the next day as well. So that will become the nocturnal urinary volume. And that's how you calculate the nocturnal polyuria by dividing with the total urinary volume. Okay. So this is how you get the nocturnal polyuria. Now, if you look at this chart of nocturnal, if you look at this chart, okay. To understand this, it's not very difficult. See, what is going on here? So first thing that you have to look in a voiding diary is whether the patient is having incontinence. So here the patient is leaking two times. Okay, so definitely there is presence of incontinence. Is it a stress incontinence? Though there is a lot of frequency, daytime frequency as well. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And... Uh, 10, then he goes to bed. So there are so many daytime frequencies, 10 daytime frequencies. Okay. So this looks like an overactive bladder like symptom. And there is uh, once a patient goes to bed, he wakes up once, he wakes up twice. So there is two nocturia. They have not specifically mentioned whether it is preceded or followed by sleep. Let us assume these are nocturia. And if you have to calculate the nocturnal urinary volume in that patient, then it will be 270 plus 300 plus you take this 330 of the next first voided volume. So that will become around 270 plus 300 plus 330, which will come around 900 ml. So nocturnal urinary volume is 900. This is the total voided volume. Okay. Again, the total voided volume of this day, you will subtract this with you will subtract the 340 because that's the first voided volume of that day. So you will not include 340, rather you will include a 330. Okay, so total voided volume will become 2380, not 90. For your calculations, this is what you have to use. Okay, and then you get the percentage, whether it's coming around 23% for that age or 20% for that age, depending on that, you label the nocturnal polyuria. If it comes under nocturnal polyuria, there can be options, how many nighttime frequencies, how many daytime frequencies are there. You calculate accordingly and mention. 
don't confuse remember to discard the first voided volume of the same day and include the next voided volume of the next day while you're calculating the total volume and when you're calculating the nocturnal generated volume don't forget to include the morning void as well this will make things easier so if the patient has nocturnal polyuria, what could be the causes of nocturnal polyuria? So usually I don't recommend reading Campbell, but this is a topic you can go through one of the, uh, for your concept building, the different causes of nocturnal polyuria. This could be because of the congestive cardiac failure or peripheral venous disease or because of diabetes and even OSA, obstructive sleep apnea. This all leads to different hemodynamic alterations in, and that leads to stimulation of the CNS and even uh, alteration of the renal physiology and for which there is uh, increased nighttime voiding. So this is how the different causes of nocturnal polyuria should be evaluated and you might get one of the options. Okay, so based on your diary, you have been given a diary and you might have to pick up one of the statements, one of the options. Remember this as uh, one of the uh, possibilities when you find a nocturnal polyuria. Okay. Now, what is, uh, how do you, when do you suspect uh, polyuria? So, as I said, polyuria is totally different than nocturnal polyuria. Nocturnal polyuria is, we have a straightforward definition. Polyuria is more than 40 ml per day. As I said, 2.4 liter per day. If the patient is voiding this much of urine, then it is said to be a polyuria. There are two causes of polyuria that should come into your mind when you get an option. It could be because of the polydipsic polyuria. That means the patient is taking a lot of water. And because of a lot of water, he's going to void a lot. And otherwise, it could be because of diabetes insipidus, where the patient is not able to absorb the water from the kidneys because the ADH is either not acting or the ADH is either not produced from the CNS. It could be central or peripheral. In a patient who is having a polyuria, you, you start thinking about a like the patient is taking more water because of that, the patient is voiding more. So you start thinking about a primary polydipsia versus a uh, or was it the diabetes insipidus? To differentiate, you do a water deprivation test and uh, you check the urine hospitality. If the patient is able to concentrate the urine after water deprivation, that means he comes back to normal, then it is likely to be a all primary polydipsia. Okay, that means he was taking more water, that's why he was voiding more. The urine hospitality more than 800 means that he's having a concentrated urine now. But if the patient continues to have dilute urine in spite of the water deprivation state, you start thinking about uh, diabetes insipidus. So if you go back to this, okay, if you go back to this, uh, sorry. So you know how to identify an overactive bladder, stress incontinence, nocturnal polyuria, diabetes insipidus, and a primary polydipsia, or how to evaluate a polyuria and go ahead with it, okay? Now you should be very confident in identifying daytime frequencies, nocturia, how many nocturia episodes are there, and how many nighttime frequency episodes are there. All these have been asked in your questions and will be asked again. So be confident with this. And uh, if you have any questions, you can share in the comment section. We'll be discussing more. I know these are confusing topics, but these are important for your exam. Thank you so much. Thank you.